So welcome to this Intro to Neural Networks um, workshop. I will be your presenter for this workshop. I'm Nicholas Ko, and let's get started. So on the slide here, you can see a few examples of, of neural networks or machine learning that we see in our daily lives. There's the Google search prediction, which uses natural language processing um, to guess, to predict, sorry, what you're going to type. And then there's computer vision, which we see used in things like security cameras and self-driving cars. Now, both of these seemingly really complex things, and yes, they are complex, are based off of a, the simple feed-forward neural network that we'll be looking at build and building today. So to start, what is a neural network actually? Because I'm sure you've heard the phrase, but maybe you've never really looked into what it what, what actually is the structure, what it does. Put simply, a neural network is just a network full of neurons, which, yeah, it's kind of self-explanatory. But if you look here at this diagram, we have the input layer of neurons, which is just going to be um, your images or whatever input you put into the neural network. So let's say you have you want to put in images. So this these values would be the pixel values of the image. So if you're putting in a black and white image, which is what we'll be doing today. Um, whoops. So if you put in a black and white image, which is what we'll be doing today, you're going to have white. Um, White's going to be 255, black's going to be zero, and all the colors in between. So you feed it in the image, and in this output layer is where we get the output of the network. So it's going to be, if you're doing image classification, say this neuron represents a dog, this one represents a cat, and this, say, this one represents a bird. So we're going to put it in the image, and it's going to be transformed into one of these three outputs. And one of these three neurons will be, quote, unquote, lit up the hiatus, because neural networks are meant to be to replicate um, the human brain. Now I'll explain what I mean by lit up in a second, but we need, we need to look at the hidden layers. And these hidden layers is where all those sort of learning and the magic happens. This is where the network is able to sort of break down the image and in, into specific features and off, based off those features, make an educated guess, because that's really what all these networks do is they make educated guesses um, to the output layer. So what is a neuron? So this neuron here is, of course, one of these individual little circles. A neuron is really just a thing that holds a number. So <clears throat> this number is going to be the weighted sum of all the other of the neurons in the previous layer that it's connected to. So if we go back here, you can see how this neuron here is connected to this neuron through this arrow, this one, this one, this one, all, all of them in the previous layer. <clears throat> so it holds this value, and is, that's the weighted sum of all of these previous neurons here. Um, so the weighted sum is done, of course, through weights and biases. So let's say I had a simple neural network with three inputs and one and one here, and you had all these three connected. So the output of this neuron would be these the sum of these three input neurons plus the weights. So let's say we have a activation of one, zero, and one, and we have weights of 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0 0.7. So this would be 0 0.5 times 1 plus 0 0.7 times 1, which I believe is just going to be uh, 0 0.5 plus 0 0.7 is 1.2. So this is going to have an activation of 1.2. So how does such a structure actually enable learning? Um, well, if we expand our little network a li just a little bit, and keeping in mind the example that we'll be looking at today, which is MNIST uh, image classification. You could see how if we take our image, right, split it up into pixels like this, and then each one of these pixels, each one of these, um, sorry, input neurons would be a pixel. See, this one's one, so it's going to be actually white. This one's going to be black, one, zero, et cetera, et cetera. What might happen is, <clears throat> the weights connecting, say, the neurons in this area, so these pixels here, might have might have strong weights to this neuron here. So what that means is that this neuron will actually be looking closely at this section, and it might be looking for, say, a line here in this one. And this neuron might be looking at, might be connected to, sorry, might have strong connections to another layer, uh, I mean, another not another layer, another region here. So let's say the bottom here. And it might have strong connections to all the input 
um, pixels in this region. And so through that, we can sort of get a feel for which features are inside of the image. Because if there's a feature here, then these neurons will light up, these input neurons in this region will light up brighter. So this neuron will light up right. And then the output layer, the output layer might be doing is it'll look at, OK, which features do we have? And based off those features, say we have this, this section, this section, and this section are all lit up bright. So there will be strong connections to that. And then this one will also light up bright. So we can be like, eh, this, we can be somewhat certain that this is a 1. And then the same thing happens for all the other numbers. So say an 8, if you have a picture of an 8, some neurons here might specialize in seeing this bottom section here. Another neuron up here over here might specialize in seeing the top section here. And these two together combined will have the eight neuron representing an eight go be here. Oh, somebody has just entered. <clears throat> so we have weights and biases, and now we know how the structure can sort of separate out features from uh, from an image, like so, and then turn those features into numbers. So now we need to get into the training of the neural network, or really how, um, or the learning part of the machine learning, rather. Because we could, we've seen that it has the capacity to learn. We just need to get it to actually learn. So the first step is loss calculation. And this little diagram here is, say, you have a linear regression, these little arrows, which is the distance between what the network would, or rather what the linear regression is predicting and the actual values, this little error. Um, so the way we do loss calculation is we start by feeding through a sample to the neural network. So let's say we fed through a sample of a one, and let's just say this is our output layer here. So we have, make those circles a little bit bigger. So you have an output, uh, output layer, so let's label that out. And then we have the truth values. So let's say that since this is a drawing of a one, this neuron represents zero, this neuron represents one, two, three. We want this one to be one and all the rest of the neurons outputs to be zero. So when we start with this first pass through, so sample set through, first pass through, these numbers aren't going to be nice like zero and one. It's going to be something like, I don't know, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0. I don't know, six, it's going to be all over the place. And none of these are really going to be correct. So what happens, or what we can do, hold on, can I change? Just to be a little thicker, I like for that. OK. So now we know that it's wrong. And to quantify how wrong it is, we see how far out it is from the truth. So this one's 0.2, right? So it's going to be, we want from the difference between 0.2 and 0. This is 0.2 off. The difference between this 0.5 and the 1 is going to be 0.5 off. The difference between this 0.4 and the 0 is 0.4. The difference between 0.6 is 0.6, and on and on and on, because there's going to be nine output neurons. But I'm not going to draw all that. So we take the sum of all of these. And that's going to be our error for the sample, or how off this neural network is for this one sample. So 2, 5, 7, 4, 6, it's what? 1.2. And then, of course, including all the other ones, actually. So it might be bigger. So let's say, I don't know, 3.5. Is going to be the error. And then, and then to calculate loss, of course, we have more than um, we have more than one sample in our set. We have all the numbers: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So if we say three, the numbers might be completely different for the three. So we might get like uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, oops, 0.6, 0.5. Doesn't matter. They're all. It's, since this is our first run through, this network is not going to perform nicely. It's going to have numbers all over the place. And we're going to have a big error again. But by averaging out the error over all the samples, we can get a sense for how the network's doing. Um, <clears throat> so next up, what do we do with this error? Great. We know the network is bad. What do we do about it? 
Well, we can start by taking that error and seeing how responsible each singular weight and bias is for that error. So that'd be how much does um, how much does each weight and bias contribute to causing the network to be bad? And the way we do that is back propagation. So it occurs in two main steps. The desired changes in the weights are determined here, which is what we store. And then the, we have to back propagate that back. So I'll show you how that's done really quick because I know those bullet points are very wordy and not very useful for all the words they have. So let's take, let's actually take a one neuron example. One, two, three. So let's say this is our output neuron for the uh, for the number, let's say six for the number six, not six, sorry, number three neuron. So this is the number three neuron and it has an output of 0 0.6, which we would like to be 0 0.0. I mean, yeah, which we, or rather which we would like to be zero. So and let's give these neurons some other activation, say one point to 0.8. So first up is we need to change these weights. So we can see, okay, we want this to be a zero and it's currently a 0 0.6. What does that mean? So that means that this weight with connecting it to the one, which we want it to be a zero, actually needs to go down. So it's closer to zero. This weight, which is 0.2, which is already close to zero. So we actually want this to go up. So we're lowering that number and then 0 0.8 once again down. Cool. And then we store those inside a long, um, inside a big matrix with all the other weights, which we'll see in a second. The other way that we can get this number to go down, besides just changing the weights, is we can actually make these all of these that it's connected to closer to zero. And the way we do that is we just take that, we say, okay, we want this one, we want it to go down by some amount, or rather minus one. This one we want to go down by minus 0 0.2. This one we want to go down by minus 0.8. Now this looks kind of familiar. Ah, sorry, familiar because that's basically what we did with this layer. So now this one's gonna have connections back here, all the way through that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we're gonna do the same thing, just backwards. So we're gonna start here, go back, change all of these weights. So up, down, up, down, up, down, do the same thing here until we, of course, we hit the input layer. We cannot change the activations of the input layer, of course, that's the image. So we, we're done once we get to the input layer and we have our loss gradient, which is how, how do we need to move each one of these weights? Now, keep in mind that we looked at this for a single sample. Of course, you're gonna have, if you just used this one sample, you'd have every number being a, what is it? Being a, I believe it was a one. And we can't do that. So we take the average over all of our samples in a batch and then we make those changes. <clears throat> cool. And that's prop back propagation. We basically built up a long list of all the changes we want to happen. Next step, gradient descent. Now, this seems vaguely complicated, you know, with the big graph and all that. In reality, we've back propagation has done a lot of the work. Um, so by back propagating, we've determined how much we need to change each weight. Gradient descent just goes and changes all the weights. That's it. Um, the reason why back propagation and gradient descent are separate is because there's actually other ways besides just go down the gradient um, that um, to do to do uh, to find a local minimum. So like if we have something like this, like if let's say our gradient looks vaguely like this, and now this is one dimensional or sorry two dimensional. So there's really only one weight that we're changing here, and of course in reality there's like thousands or millions of weights. So it's like this, but in thirteen thousand or not sorry thirteen thousand not thousands of different dimensions. Now we know that we can we want to go down this way. And so gradient descent will get us stu stuck down here at this local minimum. Now what if if there were a local minimum like if the function where it looks something like this where you could get lower what happens with regular gradient descent is just is we get kind of stuck down here, which is nice, you know, our loss, which is the y-axis. So loss and we have weight value. Our loss is low. It could be lower, but gradient descent will kind of get us stuck here because it will not go up back up the slope. 
what we have what we have now are other optimizers like Atom, Adagrad, RMS Prop, et cetera, et cetera. And so what some of these do is they have the possibility of getting us like going down here and then getting us back out and going down here to further minimize the loss and improve our network. But for this simple network, it'll work. Um, sorry, regular gradient descent will work. And of course, you can think of it like rolling down a hill gradient, just go down the gradient. <clears throat> so the, the fourth step is validation. We need a, we're basically just doing step one again, where we calculate the loss, except now instead of using this loss of training, we're actually just using this loss to, for us, the programmer, to realize how bad is this network at what it's doing. And then once we calculate that, you can see there's a little graph of, you see how the network improves over time by dropping the loss. Uh, we use data that is separate from the first step, sorry, because we're using data that is not actually included on training. So it's not learning from this. The network has theoretically never seen this data before. And what that means is that if the model is overfitting and it's like, <clears throat> sorry, if you have a really, really large model, right? Like say thousands of neurons per layer and lots of layers, what will happen is the network will just start memorizing the training samples. And that's not, that's no good. So what we do is we throw in data that we've, that it's never seen before. And if it's just memorizing things, we'll notice really quick because that training loss will go straight down because it's, you know, it knows everything. The validation data, which is never seen before, it'll start randomly guessing and that's, that's not good. And the, we'll see that the loss will go up and then you're going to realize we need to either shrink the model or we need to do something to mitigate that. So, oh, sorry, I forgot. Uh, basically, once we're done with validation, we go back to the start, recalculate loss. All of this is done over and over and over again until um, the loss has been like, has been dropped to a, a reasonable level. And the accuracy, of course, has reached a point where the network is somewhat reliable. So we know a bunch of the theory of network. Let's get to actually building one. Um, we're going to be working in Google Colab, so it's going to be uh, it's going to be colab.research.google.com, and if you want to code along, you could, of course. So you're going to build it. Oh, sorry, not build. Create a new notebook here, and we're going to start by importing all our libraries. So I'm going to assume you have some basic Python knowledge to start, and of course, if you don't, Python is a nice, readable language, so you might be able to follow along. So we're going to start by importing our libraries, TensorFlow. We're going to be using TensorFlow for this because it's nice and it's very, very widely used. And we're going to be using matplotlib to show the images. So <clears throat> so we're going to start by importing that. And the nice thing about Colab is that besides just being a Jupyter notebook environment, we also have all of these um, libraries pre-installed, so we don't need to do pip install, whatever. And so we're going to start def by defining our network. I'm waiting for those imports to finish, but I guess they won't happen for a bit. So we're going to start by creating our input layer. So if we go back to this, uh, we can use this as a reference up here. So the input layer, let me move that there. So input. And like I said, we're going to be using 28 by 20 images. So it's going to be TF. So we're going to have a special input type of layer. And we're going to say the shape of the input layer is 28 times 28, because there's 28 pixels times 28 pixel, rows of pixels. It's going to be 784, but that's nice. That's nicer and easier to read. So next, we have to define our hidden layers. So I'm going to make one a network with three hidden layers, hidden one, hidden two, and hidden three. And we're going to be using TF dense layers, which are basically just fully connected layers. If you if you've ever used like PyTorch, this, these are just these layers. They're called dense because well, they're densely connected to the previous layer because each neuron is connected to each neuron on the previous layer. That's why there's all these different arrows everywhere. So we're gonna have 128 neurons there. We're gonna do the same thing and make three layers. Nice and easy. And then we have an output layer. So we're gonna call it output. Oops. 
and this is going to be a 10 neuron dense layer because there are 10 possible options. We're looking at handwritten digits from zero through nine, actually. Yeah. And then we are going to build our actual network from that. So we have a list of layers. Next, we're going to use a so tf arrows dot layers. Um, not to start, not layers. Sorry, not all stuff. Dense. I mean, not dense. Uh, sequential model. And we're going to pass it a list of our layers. And what a sequential model is is basically just this. It's a model with a bunch of layers, and the data goes through those layers in a sequence. Uh, so we'll pass it a list of our layers. Put layer in one. Two, three, output. Oh, one more thing. On our output layer, we actually are actually going to want to have an activation function. Basically, what hap what that means is, if we go, let's say here, all of these activations in our output layer. Sorry, these activations, all these point two, point five, point four, point six, they don't add to one. And what we want is a nice probability distribution. So what we're going to do is we're going to put those through a softmax function. And what that's going to do is it's going to take all of those numbers and then squish them down so that the sum of all of these numbers is 1. So we're going to have a nice probability distribution. Um, so we're going to just so softmax that. And just like that, we defined our neural network. So next, we're going to have a look at the data we're going to be working with. <clears throat> so because the MNIST data set, is, which we're using today, is so commonly used, it's actually built into TensorFlow. And we can pull it using the <clears throat> TF uh, data sets module. So, And I'll explain this format in a second once I finish typing it out. So we're going to load that. Oh, I forgot a comma here. Sorry. So basically what this is, is X train, Y train is going to be our training set. So if we go back here, remember for validation, we use different data, different data between the two sets. So that, so that um, to prevent overfitting. And so this is our training set. This is our, I'm sorry, this is our training set. This is our testing set. And we're going to, and just so that we can have a look, we can print out the shapes of each one. So, see, oops. That should be Y test. So you can see the X is going to be or is 60,000 28 by 28 images, as you can see by these two dimensions. Um, because of course, those images are 20 by 28 handwritten pictures, and there's 6,000 just answers, which is basically what's inside each image, or the number inside each image. And then the same thing for the testing set, except there's only 10,000 samples in the testing set. If you want to see, have a look at one of the images, say X train, and then grab the first image there. And then grab, uh, grab the number that is inside of that image. OK. 
Okay, looks like we got 10 minutes left, so I'll provide a new link in a sec, or I'll, rather I'll restart the meeting in a, sorry, once the meeting restarts, um, just rejoin using the same link. Or for those watching the recording back, it's gonna be, it's just gonna be edited together, so you don't need to worry about anything. So grab the first one in the training set. And you can see that's a handwritten picture of a five and there's a five here. So that's sort of what we got. Now we do need to do some pre-processing on this data. We need to convert it into a format readable by the machine or by the neural network. <clears throat> so to start, we need to reshape. Remember how we have um, this, this picture, we have it broken down into pixels and each one of these pixels goes in. We need to break that down because we have one layer for input, which is 20 by 28, which is 784 uh, neurons big. So we need to flatten out our image. We're gonna do that using TensorFlow's reshape. I'm gonna say minus one, which means we don't know how many samples there are, which we do, but minus one means this could be any number. I'm sorry, we're starting with the shape here. Minus one, and then we want it to be 28 by 28 squished down, which is 784. Let's do that. And of course, this is X train we're reshaping. Then we do the same thing with X test. The other thing we need to do is Neural networks like to make the math a little nicer. Uh, neural networks prefer to have values between, uh, I believe, one and negative one. So we're going to squish the squish all of these values down to between zero and one simply by dividing by two fifty five because uh, the range of colors is zero to two fifty five. So. And then the same thing to X test. Oops, forgot my equal signs. Uh, one, two. And that should be all the pre-processing we need to do with the X values. For Y, we, if you recall back to this little diagram, here, I guess we can use this diagram. You can see how we want the truth values to be like 0, 1, 0, 0 for a 1. But our current truth values are just a number, uh, 5. So what we're going to do is we need to convert these into what's called one-hot vectors. So we're going to use the tf.one-hot function for that. And let's say x train. Oh, sorry, not x train. y train. Because those are the answers. The reason that I call them x and y is because if you can, if you imagine the neural network like a function, it's converting those x, the images that are the x value into y values, which are the outputs. Let's convert that into and the depth basically is how many. Um, how many items do we want in that one hot vector? And because we have 10 di total different types of images, zero through nine, we want 10. Same thing for a Y test. On that. And grab these. So I want just to have a look at the shape and an example here. So you can see this, oops. Oh yeah, can't do that anymore. So you can see how this five has become just a one hot vector with this one hot meaning that the one, only one of the values is one, all the other ones are zero. So one, zero, one, two, three, four. And then it's because there's a five, this one is one hot or lit up, six, seven, eight, nine. And then you can see that 
instead of having 28 times 28, 28 by 28 images now, we have just 7,884 pixels. Okay, so we have our model structure and we have the, um, we have the data. Next, we need to set up a, we need to set up the loss function and the gradient descent for training. And we do that using the compile function of a TensorFlow model. So network, and we need to first define the loss function we're gonna be using. Oops, I don't know how I wound up there, loss. And for this, we're gonna be using categorical, categorical sorry, cross entropy. Uh, cross entropy is used to comp compare probability distributions and because we're using the softmax, the output of this neural network is going to be a probability distribution. And of course, this is a probability distribution, just one 100% and everything else is zero. So use categorical cross entropy. And then our optimizer, which is going to be gradient descent or how we optimize our network. going to be SGD, which stands for stochastic gradient descent. Basically, the only difference between regular gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent is that um, SGD, S, sorry, yeah, SGD uses one uses batch sizes of one, and that allows for fast computation because you know you only need to do gradient descent with one batch. So we're going to compile loss goes loss. And all compiling really does is it binds the network structure to the loss that we defined and the optimizer that we defined. Loss equals loss. And really quick, I'm just going to set some metrics. And what this is going to allow us to do is it's going to let us see the accuracy by, set, by telling the model accuracy. Uh, it's going to let us see the accuracy as the model is training. One, two, okay, good, compile the network, nice and easy. And finally, the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna train the network. And that's as simple as, well, three, really three letters with TensorFlow, work.fit. And this function will take in the training data. So it's gonna be X train, Y train. And then some other optional things. So we're gonna have the validation data for our validation set. It's gonna be our X test, Y test. And finally, the number of epochs we wanna do or how many times we wanna go through the data. Let's say five and model's gonna start training. And you can see the accuracy here, the loss here. And it's already been doing pretty good because MNIST is actually, it seems a bit of a complicated problem on the surface, but once you break it down, it's not a terribly difficult one for a machine learning model to solve. You can see we've already got like 92% accuracy. Now, I think this model starts capping out at around 92. If you want, they're using activation functions. There's a way to push it to push it to like 95, 96. But like I said, MNIST is a relatively easy machine learning problem. So, yay, we made a neural network. Now let's visualize um, the predictions of that network and see how and see that it actually does work. Because you know these numbers couldn't mean anything really. Um, so we're going to start using this code the same code that we wrote up, wrote up here to display it. Uh, but we want to do it randomly. So let's grab a random number. So say I, and let's use the validation set. So it's going to be 10,000 samples. So you're going to grab the ith image. Oh. We, need, we do need to reshape that image back into 20 by 28 for it to be displayed. Uh, to reshape that one into the shape 28, 28. 
so it's nice and easy to see. Right, so starting back at where we were here, we've generated a random number and we grab this image that we need to reshape back into 28 by 28. And boom, we can see this is the seventh one. The seventh one is lit up. Seven. Actually, to make this nice and easy, we can use the tf.argmax function. And basically what this does is it returns the highest the position of the highest value here. So see, the highest one is a three. This is three. Okay. Now we need to grab the model's predictions. So we're gonna print or model prediction. Sorry, I made that an F string. And then to get the model to predict something, really easy. Model dot predict. Really self-explanatory. And let's grab the image. Or rather, not the image, because the image is like 20 by 28. Rather, the collection of pixels that we have. Uh, I it's not called model, it's called network. Whoops. And we need to convert this to tensor. Because this is actually just a NumPy array. So we need to convert that back into tensor so that tensor folk can use it. And oh yes, I forgot. This because we did because we do things in batches, we need that to be a batch of one thing. And you can see the model prediction, a little messy, a lot of scientific notation. Once again, same thing, argmax. Parenthesis, oops. And what has that done? Okay, let me check really quick that I'm not insane. Okay, and since this is getting kind of complicated, I'll move this out to a variable called prediction. There we go. All right. Not really quick. And that's, those are all zeros because I forgot the axis. Like like before, I forgot everything is supposed to be in batches. So this this was actually giving me an um um a like two D array with one thing in it. So do that again. There we go. So the highest one is a six. This is a six. Three, four. Yeah, model is pretty good. Oh, so yeah, this one's wrong. It's a, this is a two. It looks like a two. This one model predicted four, uh, one. Yeah, so cool. That's basically it.